In this episode, we're going to go through the various different changes and impacts that you can see from the Quaff update. That's right, qualities and outcome frameworks and basically what all this means for us in general practice. Um, it's going to be interesting. There's a few some minor changes. There's some major changes in there as well and definitely some key stuff you'll want to have a look at, including that lovely Quaff QI things. But we're going to cover all of that in this episode right now for you. Let's crack on and tech enhance your primary care and learning. Hey, GP learners, I'm Dr. Gandalf. And as usual, we're going to have a look at this various documents that we've had come through. Andy's having a nice little break. So I'm with you just by myself today. I'm going to go through the new Quaff updated guidance that's just been released last week. Uh, we're going to have a look at the documents itself and I'm going to go through as much of it as I can really important to mention that I am absolutely no expert on Quaff and I would highly recommend you do still look at various different parts mainly because there's, there's actually loads of minor changes in there so things like the amount of points at different criteria where a lot of them have changed by a few points here or there I'm only going to comment on some of the major changes that have happened and obviously I'm going to talk about the Quaff QI change because that's one of the biggest things that we've seen as well but just a bit of a disclaimer there that obviously do take a look for yourself and what this may mean for your practice, for your network and area and stuff. So shall we have a little look at the document? And I've got a lovely new screen share for you here that looks slightly different to previously. And we're going to have a look at the Quaff document. So the links to this are down below in the descriptions and stuff if you want to go straight to the actual document itself. Um, it's the Qualities and Outcome Framework Guidance for 23-24. And as you can see, there's loads of bump in there. I mean, it's 146 pages long. If we were to go through this page by page, we'll be here forever but i'm going to skim through the majority of the stuff that you need to know about there's the introduction you're welcome to read it and stuff it does talk about a few extra things one of the key ones is one of the changes in terms of the quaff protection that we have seen uh, come through and that's in terms of the disease registers that basically mean that you don't have to keep them but then again, it still talks about the fact you do have to maintain them it's just you're not going to be marked about whether you do or don't pay maintain them and that kind of stuff and things and then it talks about the various different clinical indicators and then the Quaff QI indicator. So here's the introduction that we mentioned. Um, it basically sets the tone for the document itself, who the commissioners are, and obviously identifying that now the commissioners are the ICBs. It's a slight change from some of the previous documents and stuff. It talks about the health indicators, um, the numeracy and all that kind of stuff, um, and how to look at your registers, basically. Um, Let's have a little look, scroll down, where's the relevant bits we want to have a look at. Verification is an important part. It talks about how to verify the information that comes through from the various different quaff indicators and stuff and where that's going to be verified. So different outcomes for different parts and what kind of data sets they may use. Um, it does talk about disputes in terms of how these can be resolved if you don't agree with the judgments that you've had. Um, interestingly, it, it talks about using NHS resolutions, which I must admit I wasn't aware of. And if those of you have been doing quaff for a while, because this is in the previous year documents, it does talk about in terms of primary care appeals and stuff that obviously this is available and stuff if needs be and then talks about the income protected payment so this is on page where are we page eight so it talks about in section two um and it talks about the fact that obviously there's been um, some flexibilities offered by nhs and as part of the changes to the contract that actually um that they're not going to um essentially mark you on whether or not you maintain the um, disease registers and stuff um, it does mention as you can see here so practice will be expected to maintain and continue to maintain these registers they perform an important role in managing clinical quality understandably you can well, you can understand that can't you because obviously the number of patients you're looking after with diabetes for example is important for you to know so for having a register but obviously you would hope that works from the coding and that kind of stuff that comes through and stuff it then talks about the various different indicators and how many points were allocated to them. And this then sums up to the total that they've now protected, which I believe was 91 off the top of my head. Apologies if I've got that wrong. But no, 81, wasn't it? Yeah, it was 81. Um, and then it lists the clinical domain um, indicators and stuff. And there are some changes here that I'm going to go through in this particular section. Um, so I'm going to focus on this particular part. There is the more detailed part that comes later. Um, and I will focus on one part in particular on that section. But for the majority of this section, talking about the change to the clinical domains, I'm going to focus on the kind of summary aspects of it, just because, like I said, going through this entire document in detail is going to take us quite a long time. 
When we talk about the clinical indicator, so one of the first ones to have a look at is the change from AF007 to AF008. Now, this me and Andy covered in our massive review that we did of the initial letter, the changes that came through and stuff. And this was more to reconcile it with some of the changes with the IIF um, nomenclature. So these were criteria that were part of the impact investment impact fund from last year that they've now kind of reconciled and stuff. And as a result of that, they've changed um, AF07 to uh, basically this new criteria of AF008. Um, important to note that the um, uh, marking criteria for this, so the attainment, uh, the thresholds and stuff has also changed. So I believe it was 40 to 80% last year for this particular criteria they've ported over, whereas in, in this financial year is now 70 to 95%. Now, that, again, this is bringing it more in line with the IAF criteria that they had for this particular thing. So this was percentage of patient, patients on quaff, um, atrial fibrillation register with a CHADVAS score greater uh, of two or more um, who are prescribed a DOAC um, or where DOAC was declined a clinically suitable uh, vitamin K, ant K antagonist and stuff. So basically DOACs and, and warfarin and that kind of stuff. So making sure those patients are there. And, um, this is an increase in the thresholds um, and it's uh, various point, 12 points and stuff that it counts towards so that's one of the, the the kind of moderate changes that we've seen within the quaff uh, system itself and then talks about um a few other changes so we've got um there's some changes to the hypertension criteria and cardiovascular disease management stuff very minor change in terms of points in particular um so moderation of the points and stuff that seems to have happened and there does seem to be a little bit more focus on hypertension and then we keep moving down, we get eventually to heart failure. So there's some terminology changes here in the heart failure ones, including, um, uh, where was it, something about ejection fractures being included. Yeah, here we are, uh, due to reduced ejection fracture um, on HF006. And that's an inclusion that we've got in terms of the criteria for managing these patients and in terms of treating them and stuff. Um, I mentioned about the hypertension, so I think all of these have adjusted slightly, so they've been increased in terms of the number of points that we've got. And then we move down to look at various different parts of the hypertension aspects and stuff and the cardiovascular disease till we get to one of the new quaff criteria, which is the cholesterol management. So this is a very focused part looking at cholesterol management. Um, there's quite a lot of points here. So 14 points on the first one, so cholesterol 001, which talks about um, having patients um, uh, looking at the percentage of patients where they've had a statin um, issued or declined. Um, and those are patients with coronary heart disease, peripheral artery disease, stroke, or chronic kidney disease. Um, so, you know, 14 points there with the thresholds of 70 to 95 percent. Then looking at patients with um, coronary heart disease, uh, peripheral artery disease, stroke, uh, who have had a non-HDL cholesterol in the preceding 12 months of lower than 2.5 or in the preceding 12 months, uh, LDL of less than 1.8. And that's 16 points, so a little bit more there in terms of those more um, potentially uh, severe patients and stuff. And then there's an additional... Um, one focusing, I believe, on some extra point. No, it was just that, that one looking at 16 points. So, um, I mean, in total, you've got uh, 30 points there looking at um, cholesterol management and stuff. Talks about diabetes. Again, um, no real major change, but some of the points and the, and the, the criteria have changed a little bit and stuff. Um, nothing major and nothing groundbreaking, from being honest, in that particular one. Um, we next get to asthma. So there are some changes in, again, the terminology. So it's now included. So one in, thing with the asthma diagnosis, it talks about having an approved um, method of testing these patients. So quality assured spirometry or an, other objective test. So pheno or bronchodilator reversibility. So that's an inclusion from last year. So I think that's making things a little bit more um, in line with guidance and stuff, but obviously adjusting for the fact that some places don't have um, assured or approved um, spirometry access and stuff and therefore that has obviously an impact on their ability to put diagnoses and stuff forward and things. Um, the next major change we don't get to till we get to really I guess the dementia um, quaff so um, in particular here they've made it an adjustment in terms of the care plan reviews that you, many of you may remember with the dementia patient patients with dementia sorry um, and that they had to be a face-to-face -face review so they've removed the face-to-face -face criteria they've also done that for the rheumatoid arthritis um, ones as well. So it's no longer required for that necessarily review to be face to face, although it does indicate that it should be in preference with the patient's choice um, in terms of what type of review that they want. 
I know that um, looking at some of the depression reviews that these are quite tight in terms of time frame. So you may need to have a look at this within your practice in terms of how quickly you're assessing these patients because um, about where it's including the data from, where that's from the 1st of January or 1st of April and stuff and, and things. So do have a look at that, but effectively that should help to manage those side of things. Interestingly, a lot of the mental health quaff points have been reduced above the board. Quite a few of them have been reduced by one point or so in terms of previous years. Um, and that's relevant to be aware of. And they have also included uh, this one, mental health um, 21. So percentage of patients with schizophrenia, bipolar affective disorder and other psychosis and those on lithium therapy have received all six elements of the physical health check for people with severe mental illness. So this is six quaff points with a 50 to 80 percent threshold. Um, and this is looking at things like height, weight, blood pressure checks, pulse checks um blood metabolic screening so for the, things like lfts um diabetes thyroid disease i can't remember if thyroid's actually on there um but also diabetes um uh, and basically those kind of checks that you would anticipate for these types of patients and stuff so there is some slightly different workload there potentially worth focusing some of your workforce if you're looking at achieving those on that particular type of population and they're needing this SMI review. Hopefully some of your local areas may have also supported by looking at local enhanced services to do that. There's some word changes in terms of the achievement stuff, the cancer stuff to have a bit more of a focus on some clinician aspect, but that it can be supported by care coordinators. Relevant because I think a lot of networks have uh, explored the option of having cancer care coordinators doing a lot of the reviews and actually they seem to be pushing this back a little bit to make it more clinician focused and things. CKD hasn't really changed as far as I can tell um, and neither has some of the other ones in terms of epilepsy. Um, learning disability is uh, as ever clear in terms of what they're recommending and stuff that you have. And I guess the next real um, adjustment that I was able to find was talking about um, the obesity um, criteria. Um, here we are. So, and this makes reference to um, the obesity being adjusted for ethnicity in particular, in terms of the quaff um, registers and stuff that they have. Now, it's interesting that obviously the quaff register side of things has, as I mentioned earlier, been protected. So you don't technically have to do it. But there is very much a focus on this one that the register itself has changed and that actually that may adjust the numbers that you're dealing with. That may have impact with some of the DES weight loss support program work that is happening. And obviously, again, lo you may locally, you may have different enhanced services. So getting this kind of information more correct and accurate and stuff may be more relevant and things in terms of what you need to look at and stuff. Um, I guess the next big changes that we've got are in the vaccinims section. Um, so this is mainly focusing on the changes in the thresholds. And this has been a significant criticism uh, driven at um, NHS England. I know myself personally, over the past couple of years, I've very much been of the view that NHS England have driven further health inequalities by some of the work that they've done when it comes to um, and it, vaccinations and IMS in terms of the change they made for the financial uh, support that practices get for doing their vaccinations and IMS process. Um, and as a result of that, I think there's been some change. Obviously, they have reduced the threshold. So now the majority have gone down to 86 percent instead of being, I think it was something like 90 percent or something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but obviously, there's a slight adjustment. So for V1001, uh, this is for your um, young children, obviously babies and stuff having their vaccinations. And it's now gone down to 86%, but that higher threshold has increased to 96%. Similarly for a VIO2, so um, in the um, preceding 12 months, having at least their MMR boosters and stuff, and that's gone to, to 86% at the lower threshold, 96% at the higher threshold. And then um, for your preschool boosters um, and stuff, effectively, this is um, 81% and 96 percent so a slight increase and where that's down to some of the hesitations we've seen previously with other types of vaccinations and then shingles continues to be there 50 to 60 percent achievement in terms of um uh, the age groups and stuff obviously important to note that the shingles vaccine is changing to a double dose vaccine um and we covered that again in the more detailed episode that myself and andy did looking at the letter when it came back back in march and stuff and i'll link to that down below if you want to have a look at it and stuff but then you can obviously review some of that information that's there in terms of the uh, documents and, and that kind of things to understand um, the more detailed changes to the shingles vaccine in particular. Um, then talks about the public health domain. So this is stuff like screening stuff. There's no real major changes here. Um, and then quality improvement, which we are going to talk about in a second. And this is a total of 74 points. 
Yeah, I'll have a look at this one in a second, shall we? Um, but as you can see, the key criteria here is um, the concept of workforce and well-being, which, which it outlines 27 points and 10 points. And then into the next section, it talks about GP access, which is 10, 6 and 6 in terms of the points. And then some reducing various um, avoidable appointments, part of it in terms of the access, an additional 15 points as well. Shall we have a look at that then? So AGP learners, we're now going to have a look at the quality improvement aspect of the QOF. So this is the QOF QI. This is some of the stuff that's hit a lot of the recent headlines and in particular a lot of the GP groups and that kind of stuff about the concept of what NHS England view to be basically well-being shall we say um and it's split into two sections like it has been on every single year there's two different types of quaff qi first one being workforce and well-being and the second one being focused around access and and the second one does dovetail a lot with a lot of the access stuff in terms of the iaf changes that have happened and obviously if you do want to check out the quality uh, uh, the um access and capacity payment stuff that myself and andy have done we cover that both in our massive episode about talking about the changes as well as in the more focused episode that looks at that particular particular um, section and stuff in terms of the payments that the practices get and stuff. But here we're going to have a look at the quaff element. So this is the practice based stuff. So that's a really important thing. This is the practice based work that you need to do in, in order to get your quaff points. Total of 74 points across the board. The workforce and well-being ones in total is 37 points and the remaining ones are allocated to the um, uh, access stuff which is split into three different parts so slight variation normally it's been a fifth um, two different parts for each one um in terms of the workforce one so it talks about the fact that the um two parts so qio 13 the contract can demonstrate continuous quality improvement activity focused upon workforce well-being as specified in the current quaff guidance and then qio 14 um the contract is participated in network activity to regularly uh, share and discuss learning from quality improvement activity focused on workforce and well-being as specified in the current QOF guidance. This would entail attending two primary care network meetings at the start and uh, expectation of two meetings will be held locally with other practices if they're not part of the networks. So standard format for that latter part in terms of what we've seen with the QOF QR about having two separate meetings, ideally one at the start of the year, one towards the end of the year to review the improvements. The key stuff that this one obviously focuses on is about I don't know, whatever the term is, but, you know, telling you to do stuff in order for your well-being that requires you to do more tick boxing and work and stuff to look after your well-being. And there's, there's loads of memes around this, obviously, going around in terms of stuff. But, yeah, anyway, we'll get into the detail of that in a second. The second part, like I said, is about optimising demand and capacity in general practice. And this is split into different parts. So optimising the use of um, staff capacity. So um, QI 016, um, which is 10 points. And the contractor can demonstrate that it's had its place uh, recognised a validated approach to understanding demand and activity. Capacity and appointment data has been made. Improvements to data quality to better reflect practice work. So it's about folk. It's similar in some ways to some of the work that we did last year in the QAF QI, um, but it's a bit more focused around the data side of things. And we'll come to what that means in a second. It then also talks about um, using uh, demand and capacity information to um, make decisions and plan uh, for the changes. So then an additional element of work there. Um, it talks about six additional points for um, uh, make sure your ours roles have access to a smart card, which to be honest is, is not a difficult thing to do. So that's a quick six points, to be honest, just making sure they have access to that. And then the final part is talking about reducing avoidable appointments. Um, and this is a bit more involved this QI9, QI019, talking about how to have some improvements in terms of focusing on what they term as avoidable appointments. And we'll get into that in a bit more detail. This is a fair chunk. This is 15 quaff points in total. And it does have some suggestions of how you can do that listed here. So I'll just go through some of the suggestions that they've come up with. So using uh, business intelligence tools, BI tools, and that's a common term you may now start hearing from NHS and various other ICB places and stuff. So if available, using the tools um, to collect data to understand practice activity, um, including variations on day, times, weeks, and et cetera, and stuff. Developing an understanding on the telephone queue, either by extracting data from cloud-based telephony. So remember, in a lot of this, they've pushed towards many practices moving towards cloud-based telephony, or asking staff to collect that data over a period of time. Using the data to understand the peaks of activity and then better understand capacity and demand and how you can manage that in terms of potentially changing rotors. 
using improvement techniques to demonstrate primary transformation teams webinar series on demand capacity. So that, you know, some of the work that has been offered to help practices and referencing RCGP, six steps to improving delivery continuity. So it's one of the only mentions about look folks on continuity really in this particular thing, but we will have a look at that in more detail. Talk about why they put the quality in, improvement stuff in there and things and it's about trying to improve general practice and some various links to resources you may want to have all cats so from nhse rcgp qi stuff health foundation various other organizations and things um but let's have a look at the actual criteria shall we so the workforce and well-being so it focuses on the fact that it's fuller in particular the fuller stock take that myself and andy reviewed last year focuses on the various different um, impact that basically general practice is pretty much screwed moving forward with workforce and stuff so therefore they need to have a look at how they can help support the workforce very much a focus on training and support that comes through in, in some of this in terms of direct support to individuals um uh, Argue whether it's there in the actual document stuff and also highlighting some of the other documents that are coming out or have, sorry have been out like the people plan various other things also mentions core 2050 at one point as well so that's the the setting of the tone the overview of the module so the overarching aim is about improving well-being resilience and the risk of burnout in the general practice workforce seriously that's what they're focusing on in this particular way yeah i know Let's get back to it, shall we? Sorry. Um, but effectively, it's talking about supporting the onboarding of the staff. It's talking about various aspects in terms of training and support and establishing peer groups, which, OK, that part I definitely agree with. In fact, to be honest, a lot of this I agree with in principle, as this is what practices should be doing. And if you've not got some of this stuff, then actually it can have an impact on the way that your workforce may be retained, because actually this is all stuff that's really sensible to do. Could I, my main issue with all of this is the fact that there just isn't the resources to support us doing this if you're not already doing it. That's the key thing. But it talks about undertaking an exercise to evaluate workforce well-being factors um, and then reasons, you know, look at various different things. So you can look at absence reports, you can look at what support staff have in particular in types of groups and stuff. And support for new starters in particular. So I think many training practices hopefully have covered this with their new starter regimes in terms of training and, and you know, also GP regs coming in. This is a great project for your GP trainees to potentially to do. So it will massively sort out their QIP or QIA projects that they need to do and help your practice in terms of what you may need to do if you haven't already done so and stuff. And then obviously it talks about improving the plan and what you can do from there. I guess key point, if you do want some support with managing the clinical side of things in terms of um, onboarding and training and stuff, um, I do have resources to help with that. I guess if you did want information to help you with the whole onboarding of staff and things, particularly clinical staff, I do have resources that can help you with that. Obviously, for clinical system engagement. So for the system one, we have the free resource, which is the YouTube video. But if you want a lot more detail on helping your staff to use system one more effectively, which I would always recommend, then definitely check out the system one for clinicians course that I run, as well as we're going to be soon having one for EMIS users as well. Yeah, there you go. There's a bit of a spoiler for you. So an EMIS course for clinicians, a system one course for clinicians that absolutely you can access and stuff. And if you want bulk ordering of that um, in terms of tickets and stuff for your practice, just email me egplearning at gmail.com and I'll be more than happy to discuss the pricing and stuff for that for support for your practice teams. So in particular, we may see things like um, more support and training for reception staff, care coordination staff, care navigator staff, whatever you want to call your admin teams. But important to recognize that that training stuff should be really there and stuff. Um, and then obviously it talks about various other aspects that we need to have a look at, including, including, I guess, about actual holistic support. So it talks about what areas you can focus on to improve. I think some of the stuff I like about is the fact that it does mention about having some space for your staff, you know, looking at what you're doing, that kind of stuff. And there's some bits I don't quite understand. So the health and service, health and safety executive risk assessment templates. So I've tried to have a look at these and the really basic templates that basically evaluate risk within you, I think your organization or for the individual, not the easiest for on my quick glance to have a look at and stuff. And I guess as practice managers out there, they'll be able to educate me far better on what these are probably are and stuff. Um, but effectively reviewing the risk to your practice, what would happen if your staff were off, that kind of stuff. Talks about having um, various different champions, so EDI champions, mental health well-being champions, um, well speak up 
champions and that kind of stuff. It talks about using some of the resources like looking after you. It talks about training resources for leaders within your organization and that kind of stuff. So there is some good stuff in there. It, it just feels so enforced and so pressured in terms of doing stuff. It, I, I don't know. It talks about creating a, a good culture within the practice, absolutely supportive of that. And in terms of how you can be better leaders, it talks about having appraisals for your staff, for all staff. So interesting if that will also apply to partners and who's going to be doing those appraisals for partners. There's no real guidance in, in this document about how to do that side of things. And particularly one of the key focuses, this very much focuses on the well-being of staff. It doesn't really mention about partner well-being at all in this particular section of the document and stuff. And that's obviously something I clearly have some reverence with, given that I'm a partner and things. Um, but it does focus on their leadership skills and abilities and that kind of stuff. And then about um, supporting, as I mentioned, new staff, but also then um, training the team and things. And there's a lot of this stuff, as I said, seems really sensible if you have the time to do it. And I think you should be doing it, to be honest. This is what leads to a good, cohesive organisation. But the problem is, is obviously the, the challenge of being able to do some of this and stuff. It talks about the peer support networks. I'm, I am a massive fan of having people having the opportunity to talk to other people in their groups and whether you set that up internally, whether you do other kind of things. It talks about having a shared space. Obviously, estates is a massive challenge for many practices. But quick tip, I guess, if you want, bean to cup coffee machines in your breakout rooms definitely will help the morale of everybody at the very least and if you're not a big fan of coffee like myself well tea machine and stuff and things like that and, and things clearly would be a more useful in, in, in that sense and stuff it does focus as it does often with the qi stuff that needs to be smart objectives so you know um obviously specific measurable achievable um relevant and time bound and then obviously looking at the change that you're making and then evaluating those changes and that's where the second part of the those meetings comes into play with it being registered with your primary care network as in the review meeting there's the standard template that comes with this and that you can then fill in. It does interestingly mention that whether those meetings should be chaired by your CD or somebody else potentially coming into the organization to support with that, whether that's some of the other clinical leads, health and equalities leads, practice managers, potentially all going externally and things. I don't know. Have a think about how you want to consider doing this. I mean, one thing maybe to consider, the NHS 75th birthday is in July. Maybe it's worth combining the first meeting that you have with that, making a bit of a celebration. I don't know. I'm just get offering some more suggestions and ideas here to primary care and, and stuff to see if you can achieve this a bit more fun way rather than what seems to be the very prescriptive and um, authoritarian way of trying to make well-being happen in general practice and stuff. I appreciate that NHS England are probably doing something that they think is really positive. I must admit, like many, I don't feel that this is a really positive way of changing things because it's so prescriptive in terms of some of the stuff that you then need to consider doing. And it's dovetailed, so that's the form in terms of what you need to look at, but then it's massively dovetailed by um, the access stuff that comes with this. And, and this is a lot more detailed, so important that you do have a look at some of this stuff. So it talks around optimising access to general practice. Um, obviously, the government's perspective is access is the only thing they really want to focus on. Although, interestingly, this does make some reference about continuity, as I mentioned earlier, in parts of it and stuff. So it talks about the overview, understanding data in relation to practice demand capacity and understanding quality improvement techniques, making changes to tackle capacity and demand more effectively and improving staff well-being somehow in, in the way of the process of doing that, whilst also improving patient experience. So it talks about the plan you can look at doing. So um, access and implement um, improvements to the data quality. And there's massive focus on data improvement here, um, understanding variation and then being able to use that data to then come with an output and stuff and make a change and then monitor the impacts of that change as well. Um, it hasn't really given much detail in this sense in terms of what you could potentially do initially but then later it does give some really good examples of things you might want to consider doing as a practice or potentially as a network to evaluate the different things that you can do it does talk about um, demand management tools so there are a variety of these different types of tools i've covered a few of these on the egp learning channel um, so things like rapid health um, apex that kind of stuff they all have elements of you know the bi stuff come into play some of the telephony providers exxon and similar have elements that you can use and and tools that you can leverage in some of this part as well as obviously Arden's primary care IT do similar in terms of looking at some of the patient demand aspects of things. 
it's unfortunate that a lot of the data isn't inbuilt into the clinical systems like EMIS and System 1. That would be so much more easier if it was. Um, and I have tried working with some LMCs to come up with other routes of data management and that kind of stuff, but that's proved quite challenging because actually extracting that without the API access and stuff is a bit more challenging than things anyway. But anyway, when we look at the various different parts, so um, it talks about various options you could consider doing. Um, if you were to use BI tools, business intelligence tools, and obviously these can be put into dashboards using visualizations and other kind of things to help understand some of the challenges that you're having. Um, it does make reference to avoidable appointments. Now, and this is a concept I think many of us in general practice really struggle to manage because avoidable appointments can do occur let's be honest they do occur you know sometimes having patients booked in for for example their medication review and they just had it reviewed a couple of weeks before that's clearly an avoidable appointment um i think there's you know, bringing back multiple pa patients multiple times for different aspects of their chronic disease review that potentially could be reviewed by practices and networks and stuff to make that streamlined and therefore save on appointments there possibly the use of group consultations to help manage multiple patients at similar times and that kind of stuff. Um, but, the, you know, it does give some reasonable examples that you may want to consider. Um, it talks about the smart car process, which I think is a quick win for many people in general practice. Just make sure your arts roles have the right type of smart card access and roles that they should have in order to continue with their work. Um, so definitely do see if you can tick that one off fairly quickly. And then using the type of appointment data to have a look at what you could change. So it talks about implementing plans. Let's get back into the examples because that's probably the more useful part for many of you. So I think there's seven different examples it mentions. So example one, a practice is limited on understanding the demand capacity and how it varies throughout the week and year and have a high level of unmet demand. So they could potentially count their unmet demand through the reception team or they could use um, some of the um, tools I mentioned and uh, platforms I mentioned that could do that and then use that alongside appointment data to see how many extra patients were squeezed in to give you an, an estimation of those kind of patients and stuff. Um, and then you can use that to predict further demand moving forward. Um, if practice is not consistently coding data on appointment uh, consultation type mode to look at the modes of appointments and that kind of stuff and see whether that has an impact and things. It talks about other options in terms of um, reattendance of patients and is that appropriate, is that not appropriate? So this may be similar to some of the work you may have done last year in the Quaff QI about uh, access and stuff. Uh, I know in our network we did that about high attendance users and how we can support them more effectively. So that could be, you know, um, another area to explore if that's not something you've already done. Um, how appointment slots are being used and distributed um, across different members of the team. So make sure there's fair and equitable workload, which, you know, I think majority of us are just working flat out. So I don't really know how you can change that in some places, but you never know in your practice area you may be available to do so. Practice, um, if they're looking at complaints, so they can have a look at how they can streamline the process of booking and stuff. Um, practice team meeting, GPs raise a large amount of time to take non-clinical work. So is there a process you can look at? Is there some of the additional roles that you can look at, I guess? Um, so things like GP assistance, care coordinators to help manage some of that administrative-based workload and, or using some other tools, like, for example, um, you know, ones that help you with your records management, that kind of stuff as well. Um, and then I think this was one of the final ones, improve the continuity of care. So is there an option of moving towards named GP basis or other kind of named teams potentially to manage the care of patients, um, regular practice meetings, for example. These are kind of some of the things that you could potentially look at and explore doing as a method of um, improvement. And then again, it's about doing that whole process of the QI cycle to have a look at that and, and see what you can change and then reviewing that with your network team. And here's the template again that explains some of those details in terms of what changes you've done, what you've tested and how this went down in your network meeting and stuff. And that is the QI stuff that you may need to want to have a look at and stuff. So now we're going to take a look at the last kind of changes and stuff. So the, to be honest, the rest of the QAF document is the standard kind of thing. It talks about personal care adjustments and when and when you shouldn't be making these um, in terms of uh, for patients and, and, and in terms of exclusions and that kind of stuff. I must admit, I couldn't find anything um, significant or, or game changing in, in terms of um, looking at these particular aspects and stuff. So I probably just recommend having a brief read if you wanted to confirm. It does talk about when you don't have access to particular types of testings and there's different kind of adjustments that happen, for example, for the um, if you don't have access to spirometry and things, what happens in those situations? Um, so, yeah, asthma, COPD and dementia in terms of the diagnosis side of things. Um, it talks about when it may be not be suitable, so about registrations of patients. Um, I think there is some stuff about um, the vaccination-based ones in here. 
Um, interestingly, and it talks about patients coming from abroad in particular, it talks um, if they've had a UK approved immunization schedule, then it's just simply to add that information. If they haven't, then you may want to use the personal care um, exclusions kind of thing to, to manage that particular part and that they may consider that happening from this year onwards and stuff. So there is a bit of information in there that's worth having a look at in that respect and stuff. And then ultimately, it then talks about the codes that have been um, reconciled and taken off and stuff um, in terms of, yeah, what they've removed and, and what they've adjusted because they have it and retired various different codes and things. And that EGPLN is, is basically the QOF changes uh, according to the contract in summary. Um, if there are more specific things that you think are worth looking at, do let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your perspectives and what are kind of options you're considering. If you're going to be looking at the QOF QI side of things, what projects are you going to be looking at? And do feel free to join myself and Andy and Tara and Ben as we are supporting as many practices and networks as we can on 29th of April looking at a live stream basically looking at the contract changes in whole later on this month on the 29th of April um, I appreciate that it's going to be the bank holiday weekend but it, you know you've got the extra Monday so according to NHS England at the very least you've got some well-being time to do it haven't you yeah obviously um but in terms of i guess what we can look at in that session is supporting um practices and networks in terms of some of the more detailed kind of change that we would have had a lot more time to analyze and obviously by then we will have an idea of what the bma are particularly planning in terms of general practice as well with some of these changes i appreciate many people are frustrated by the perspective taken by the um commissioners nhs england and that kind of stuff in terms of the changes with these contracts and stuff if you do have any more comments, let me know. If you do want to check out some of the details as well, so do have a look at this video that, like I said, is the capacity and access a payment section that's very relevant to this particular topic that we've been talking about. Ultimately, you may want to check out one of these episodes that gives you more detail about some of the other DES enhancements and stuff. And as always, we're here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning. And catch you in the next episode.